what is the difference between preaching and teaching? And I'm going to be honest, I was totally wrong on this one. I started out, I had in my mind what the difference was. I think it was culturally influenced. And I thought, you know, I'm just going to do a word search. So I went through and I searched every time it said preaching, preach, preached, preacher, teaching, la da da, you know. So I was wrong. And my, the conclusions that I came to scripturally, I just thought it was neat how it went in a complete different direction than where I came from. So I am going to share with you a lot of scripture because that's where our confidence lies. And I want you to see where I'm coming from when I made these conclusions. That being said, I could be wrong and I'm totally okay with that. But this is what I discovered. It seems that preaching comes with some part of being anointed or sent. And I say some part, meaning that's not the totality of it, but I have 10 different scriptures. Isaiah 61 that says, the Lord anointed me to preach. Jonah, he was sent to Nineveh to preach. Mark 16, 15, and in Matthew, Jesus went to the 11 disciples specifically and gave them the great commission, go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Matthew 10, 7, Jesus told the disciples to preach the gospel of the kingdom of heaven and the kingdom of God. So that was, he sent them out. It wasn't just the 11 disciples there. There were many of them that went two by two. Romans 10, 15, uh, Paul says, how can they preach except they be sent? So that was an element that there were some people who needed to be sent to preach the gospel. Timothy was told by Paul to preach the word, be instant in season, out of season. Acts 13, 4, the missionaries were being sent forth by the Holy Ghost and they preached the word of God in the synagogues. And Paul says he was ordained a preacher and an apostle. So there is an element that some people are sent or ordained or anointed to preach, but is that prohibitive of anybody else preaching? And that was a question that I asked and I, the scriptures that I saw in that were in Acts chapter 1, verse 8. We see something that cross references in Acts chapter 8. So Jesus is talking again to the 11 disciples. I kind of thought that the, at the Mount of Trent, at this mount where he ascends back up into heaven after the crucifixion, I imagined that there were a lot of people there at the bottom of this hill, and Jesus gave this grand message, and then. And then up they went, and this is where all of the disciples were told to go out into Judea and Samaria and all the uttermost parts of the earth. This is like the traditional missions message in my mind. And he actually was only talking to the 11 disciples. And he said in verse 8, But ye shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you. And this is talking about after the day of Pe the Pentecost. And it says, and ye shall be witnesses unto me both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and in Samaria and unto the uttermost parts of the earth. And I just want to point out that this is prophetic. This isn't necessarily a command. He didn't command the disciples to do that. He said that they would. And that's important lest we think that this is just a direct message to the disciples like in the Great Commission. I'm not saying that the Great Commission is just to the disciples, but... I don't want you to confuse that this is only for them because this says they shall be witnesses unto me both in Jerusalem, Judea, and unto, in Samaria, and the uttermost parts of the earth. And then in Acts chapter 8 verse 4, it's talking about how Saul persecuted the Christians who had been staying in Jerusalem, even though God said that after Jerusalem they would be going out. So they were currently in Jerusalem, and this is the fulfillment of that prophecy. It says, Therefore, they that were scattered abroad due to Saul's persecution went everywhere preaching the word. And that is when they went out into the uttermost parts of the earth. So that just shows there's liberty. None of these people were specifically called to preach or called to be missionaries. It just says, therefore, they that were scattered abroad went everywhere preaching the word. Therefore, if you don't particularly have a call, it's not prohibitive of you to preach. And that also, you can look see that in Titus, or I'm not sure if it might be Timothy. It says that if thou hast a desire to be a bishop, that thou hast a good desire. Again, that shows that you don't necessarily have to have a call to be a pastor. 
But in the case of being a bishop or a pastor, you do have to be proven blameless through those God gives qualifications there. So I just wanted to give that balance that there does seem to be a part where some are anointed and sent. And then there seems to be some liberty where some just preach the gospel. Okay, the next thing is that preaching seems to have a specific message. So if you look at preaching, it seems that God gave people a message that Isaiah, he was anointed to preach a certain message. Jonah was sent to Nineveh to preach to them they need to repent. John the Baptist, he preached repentance. Jesus, before he died on the cross in that dispensation, he told them to go out to preach that the kingdom of heaven is at hand, or the kingdom of God is at hand, and that is the message that he preached. But then after the cross, he sent them out to preach the gospel and to preach the word. So there is a difference, but the key element is that there was a specific message that they were to be given to other people. Now, let's compare that with teaching. As I researched the word teaching and teach in scripture, it seems to overlap preaching, which is consistent where it says that a person who is a pastor must be apt to teach because of what teaching is. So we'll say that preaching is a message. And teaching is the instruction and the knowledge within there. It's more educational. But it says in Acts 5, 42, that they were to teach and preach Christ. Mark 16, 5, it says preach the gospel. But in Matthew 20, it says go ye therefore and teach all nations. So it's kind of a overlapping. In Matthew 11, 1, it says Jesus began to teach and preach in their cities. So there was both of them. But when it's talking about specifically teaching, it's more raw instruction. And in Jeremiah 32, 3, it says, I taught them rising up early and teaching at them, yet they have not hearkened to my instruction. So there's that word instruction. And then Matthew 28, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. So it's actually teaching them to do something. And Titus 2.12, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lusts, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world. So it's not just teaching them what, it's giving them instruction of what to do. And that is consistent with Titus 2.3, teaching the young women to be discreet, chaste, keepers at home. And so it has that those elements of pointing out truths and facts and giving instruction of what to do. And that also goes with the Old Testament where the parents and the Levites and the priests were supposed to teach the law of God, not just what the law was, but that they were supposed to do it. And then also teaching comes with an element of authority. In Matthew 21, it says that as Jesus was teaching in the synagogues, people were amazed and they actually questioned him. Who gave thee this authority to teach? And then lastly, teaching can be done, done through songs and hymns and spiritual songs in Colossians 8, 16. So it's not always just a line upon line, precept upon precept. Here's a notebook. Here's how it goes. There are many ways that we can learn. So that's it.